Welcome back to the International School of the Word, a study of angels. Uh, this course is called an expository study of angels, and we're on lesson seven. And lesson seven is about angels unaware. So we're going to talk about people uh, who have encountered angels, and perhaps you didn't realize that you're encountering angels. I think out of all the lessons that were done on angels, this is the one that might be the most convincing that you have perhaps seen an angel. I think if you ever saw a seraphim, you would know it. <laughs> I think you, would, you wouldn't you would have any second guesses if you would have seen a seraphim. But um, I think that you will see in this lesson that there are possi- there's the possibility that, you've, that you have seen angels. I think everyone in this room has seen an angel. That's what I think. I think that most of the people on the planet have seen angels. Whether they realized they were angels or not, I believe they are among us all the time. So we're going to talk about that. So let's start with Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verse 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, or by so doing, some have unwittedly uh, entertained angels. I don't think this is just a reference to uh, the couple of times in the Bible that angels showed up and people didn't realize they were angels. I think this is a statement that really applies to every era of time, that applies to every country, every language of the world, every nationality. I think angels are among us. I think they're here, and I think that we see them, and they're God's messengers uh, to minister to us, and we'll see that in a moment. Uh, And I think that they're everywhere. If you go to certain countries, like the country of India, if you go to India and they've never seen you before, almost every person you see will do this. They'll fold their arms, and they'll bow their head, and they'll just do this. So I was there just a few months ago, and everybody in the hotel, on the streets, they kept doing like this. And I asked someone, I said, um, I realize this is your custom, because I was doing this back, because I didn't know <laughs> what to do, you know. And I said, by the way, what does this mean? And they said, oh, they're doing that just in case you're an angel. I said, what? They said, yeah, they, they, in their country, of course, they believe in reincarnation. So they believe that you could be uh, an advanced you know, form of, uh, of spiritual enlightenment somehow. So they thought that you could be an angel. You could be a loved one reincarnated. Now, probably not because in their belief, and I don't want to get off on that, they believe that you go down each time. So if you start off as a human, the next time you come back as a good dog, <laughs> the next time you come back as a cat, which is lesser than a dog, and I don't care what you say, and then, and then, you know which side of that fence I'm on, then you go down to a mouse, which is the lowest of them all, and uh, anyway, so you keep going down. So they believe that you get smaller each time. So when you encounter a human, you're most likely not encountering another human. You're encountering an angelic being. So in their belief, they don't know if if that's you. Now, the same thing is true in a lot of Middle Eastern cultures. They also have some of the very similar practices that they are very hospitable to strangers because they don't know if you're an angel. And of course, that scripture bears that out. And I think that it would do us all good to treat uh, strangers with more kindness, because we may be surprised one day when we realize that it was an angel with his hand out just to put us our heart to the test. We may be surprised. Uh, I've led probably 50 missions trips uh, in my lifetime, and uh, I've taken literally hundreds of people, more than I can count, to the mission field, many of those which are missionaries today, which I'm very proud of. But um, I always tell the groups when I take a group out, that you're going to meet three people on this trip. Number one, you're going to meet yourself without all of your titles and furnishings. You're going to be stripped down to nothing, and you're going to find out who you really are. Uh, When you don't have everything else to lean on and anything to hide behind, you're going to find out who you really are. You're going to find out what your heart's made of. Secondly, uh, you may encounter Jesus uh, at some point in time. And thirdly, you'll make a friend for life. When I tell them that they may encounter Jesus, I will tell them that I believe I will tell them about the Christophanies in the scripture that you could either encounter Jesus or an angel. And when you do so, you may not recognize them as such. It may be an old man. It may be a little boy or a little girl. It may be a beggar on the side of the street. And you never know uh, which ones. If the angels carried the beggar Lazarus uh, to heaven 
and the rich man was just buried, it says, you know, I think they might hang around the beggars more than we think. All right. So keep in mind that um, that entertaining an angel unaware is a theological fact, a very solid theological fact that quite possibly everyone on our planet has encountered an angel, whether you realize it or not. One thing we know about angels is that angels are everywhere. So if we take the 2013 census of the planet to be correct, which we're, I don't know how they get that. They say that there's 7.1 billion people on the planet. So I believe that there's more angels than that because they are innumerable. And so I believe that it's quite possible that all 7.1 billion of those people have encountered an angel, whether they realize they encountered an angel or not. We just looked at the passage in 2 Kings 6 where Elisha says to his servant, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So um, let's look at that passage one more time. So he said to them, do not fear for those who are with us are more than are with them. So I believe that people encounter angels because I believe this statement to be literal, that there are more angels than there are people. And so if that is the case, then it's quite possible that we've all seen them sitting on a bus, on an airplane, uh, driving in, the, in, the, in a car. So I'll tell you a few stories as we progress through this teaching of other people who've seen angels. So let me go back to an encounter that I had as a kid. And I was told, I remember this story very well. I was there. I, I recall it vividly. But... Um, I will tell you as they've told it to other people. I was at a congregational holiness camp meeting, if you know what that is. And um, it was an old fashioned, like sawdust floor type camp meeting. And I was a kid and I remember we were sitting there and the minister was preaching on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, people came forward. My guess is there were less than 100, but maybe 80 to 100 people that came forward to be filled with the Holy Ghost that night. As they gathered and prayed around the altars, uh, we believed in those days, and we should still believe, but they would tarry until they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So they would pray a long time. So they were down there praying. There was all kinds of people praying, and the altar call had been going on for about 15 minutes. And then suddenly this man walks in. He looked like, a Benny, like he had on a Benny Hinn suit. Uh, we'd never seen Benny Hinn <laughs> yet, so we didn't know what a Benny Hinn suit looked like, but he had a white suit and white white uh, shoes, and that I remember. He just walked in the side. It looked like he had been outside. He looked like someone who had arrived late because he just walked out the side. He never spoke to any person. He just walked down the length of that tabernacle. It was an open-air tabernacle, so no, do- no sides. It was an outdoor a tabernacle. All he did was walk down the, the width of that. And I remember seeing this as a kid. It was like a domino effect. When that man walked by them, all of the people he walked by began, were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of the people just began, they didn't even know he was behind them. He didn't walk up and say anything. He didn't touch anybody. He just walked through that tabernacle. And I saw people falling back like that, just all over the place. It was just like a like a bowling alley. I mean, they were just coming down one after the other. And it was amazing. And as a kid that stands in my mind and no one knew him, they all were talking about him for days after that. Who was this man? I I think it took a while for them to even um, realize he was an angel because he didn't have on a halo, (laughs) which we've already discovered they don't have halos. And he didn't have wings, which we've already discovered that most of them probably do not have wings. He just sat on a white suit and white shoes and he just walked right by and people began to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you a few other stories like that, but that was one that I remember when I was about probably 11 or 12 years old. And uh, that has stuck with me all these years. So one of the things about angels that we know is that angels are ministering spirits. So I want to look at this passage and see what it means. And notice this, how this how this is worded in the book of Hebrews. Are they not all ministering spirits? Are they not all 
So every angel, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So in this passage, he's basically calling angels ministering spirits. We will resume this teaching after a short message from International School of the Word. This teaching is one lesson taken from a full course on isow.org. If you are enjoying this video, we invite you to check out the full course in the links below. For the best value, try our All Access Pass. At just $99 per month, you can access thousands of hours worth of high quality, world-class teaching. To check local pricing in your country, visit isow.org. For more great teachings like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Now, back to this teaching from International School of the Word. In Psalm 103, he refers to the same thing. Bless the Lord, you His angels, who excel in strength, who do His word, heeding the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts, you ministers of His who do His pleasure. So again, we have two references there where angels are actually called ministers. Okay, what kind of ministers? Um, I'll never forget one time I was in an airport and someone said, um, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a minister. They were not religious at all. They thought I worked for the government. When I said that, they said, oh, minister of what? Minister of education, minister of commerce. They thought that I worked in Washington, D.C. because they were totally unfamiliar I guess, with the minister of the gospel. And I said, no, I work for the king. And that's, I left it at that. They said, oh, pardon me. That's, that was my answer. Do you work for the government? No, I work for the king. Oh, well, great. Nice to meet you. And I meant every word of it. Um, so when you see this term, ministering spirits, um, what does it actually mean? Well, it comes from the, it comes from the word, um, it, it's actually a Greek word. It's, it's the word where we get the word liturgy from. So the Greek word would be liturgikos, but it's where we get the word liturgy from. And so it means to perform a service or employed to minister a service. So a liturgy. I'm employed, so I've been hired or employed by someone to do a particular service. Maybe I'm registering people. That's what I've been, I've been employed to do. So the term is not very spiritual. It just means you're on assignment to do something very specific. Uh, if you look at the Greek word, if you well, let's, let's go to the Hebrew word for minister. Okay. So the Hebrew word for minister would be the word sarat, which means to serve in the work of the Lord. Uh, a sarat, someone who serves in the work of the Lord. The Greek word is a word that you probably heard before in English, or at least a variation of that. It's, it's diakonia, which is a deacon in a church. And the word deacon literally means an attendant or table waiter. So if you, if you read in Acts 6 where the deacons were employed for the first time by the, by the apostles, they basically were, they had a problem because they were serving the tables of the widows and the orphans, feeding them every day, and they did not have time to go out and do the gospel. And they said, you know, it's, it's not fitting that we should wait on these tables every day, which we're willing to do, but the gospel is not going forth. So let's find some men full of the Holy Spirit. So they appointed the first di diaconias, the, the deacons, and their official um, job description was to wait on tables. So if you go to the restaurant, it's a, the job of a deacon. When someone comes and says, may I take your order, please? That's what deacons do. Deacons do not control churches or boards or ministers. Hallelujah. They are supposed to be the servants of the church. But somewhere along the way, that got really mixed up. I don't know what happened. Now they think they're, they're there to protect the church. No, you were never there to protect the church. You were there to serve the church. Wait on the tables. Uh, another sermon for another day. 
Uh, boy, and you don't want me to preach that one, I'll tell you, because <laughs> I may get tough with that one. Uh, so ministering spirits basically are angels on assignment that were sent to serve the public. So sometimes we want to, you know, we want to make them fluttery and, you know, we want to make something really uh, kind of uh, supernatural about it. They are supernatural, but their job description is to serve. So God is sending a ministering spirit on his behalf to serve. So let's look at some of the examples of a ministering spirit sent to serve. Now, here's one that you will probably recognize right off. Matthew 4, 10 and 11 then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So you know where you're at. This is the temptation. Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels, more than one, angels came and ministered to him. So here's Jesus in a fast, and the angels came and ministered. Now, if you look at pictures of angels ministering to Jesus uh, in the Bible. It's like they showed up with harps and I mean, a man on a 40 day fast who's just done three rounds with the devil doesn't need a harp. I'm telling you, he needs a bowl of soup or something. He does not need a harp. I've gone three rounds with the devil himself and I haven't eaten in 40 days. I don't think they came to sing. And if you look at other pictures, it's like a little girl angel holding Jesus. You know, I think he could, you know, I don't know if he needed a hug right then or not. I think he needed a bowl of soup. So, so what you see with Elijah is you see Elijah the prophet at the end of a fast. What does the angel do? He comes and cooks a meal. The cooking angels we talked about in one of the previous lessons. He came and cooked the meal and gave it to Elijah. So that's what I think they did. I think this angel, I think I see one angel here in the picture with a, at least a piece of bread. Thank you. <laughs> and it happens to be a girl angel, by the way. <laughs> For all of you who are still wondering, you're still in doubt, at least in that artist's mind. It looks like they're all girl angels to me. So listen, if I was a lonely man in the middle of the desert, I'd want them to send all girl angels too. That'd just be nice. So look here. He, he, Jesus is surrounded by angels and my in my guesstimation of it they're feeding him they're not just singing and holding him they're feeding him so their angels are diakonos diakonias they are table waiters so it just seems fitting that when the angels came to minister to jesus at the end of the 40-day fast they would wait his table and they would feed him food so there could be other things that they did as well, but it just seems like his body was weak and it's more feasible to me that they fed him, cooked for him, um, you know, maybe brought him a pillow, something to get him rested up, uh, than just showed up with heart. I think I'd get mad if they just showed up and sang. <laughs> After all I've been through, and that's all you got, really. <laughs> I mean, one of these days they're going to sing victory in Jesus, and that's going to be about me from what I just got through doing here. And you want to sing? Come on now. I'm having a little fun with you, but, um, but keep in mind that, that the angels came to minister to Jesus. Okay, so here's the big question among angels unaware, entertaining angels unaware. How about guardian angels? Do we all have a guardian angel? So let's look into that. The short answer is yes. The long answer is maybe not. So let me explain that to you. Okay, now that you're thoroughly confused, let me explain what I mean by that. We sometimes get confused about the teaching of guardian angels because when we teach that every Christian automatically has a guardian and then suddenly somebody gets killed in a car wreck. Somebody falls down and gets hurt, and we say, what happened to you not dashing your foot against a stone? Uh, somebody breaks their back by falling off of a ladder, uh, you know, roofing a house, and they're a Christian. Where was your guardian? When Jesus was told, jump off the temple and they'll catch you. Why didn't he catch you? So that messes up our theology when we just carte blanche say that everyone has a guardian angel period. 
and it messes up our theology. So I do believe in guardian angels, but I don't believe in angelic bodyguards in that sense. So there's a difference in a guardian and a bodyguard. There's a difference in someone who's been assigned to minister to you and someone who's been, who's been assigned to protect you. Now, can angels protect us? And the answer is absolutely yes. Angels can protect us. So we're going to look at some passages in the Bible that talk about guardian angels, but I would call these contingency passages. Meaning, uh, if you, if, for those of you who like math, they have if-then equations. If you do this, then it turns out this way. It's an if-then equation. But it only works out if you do this. So a contingency passage would be where God says, if you do this, then I will do this. So it's the same thing. So much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online at iso.org forward slash donate or text the word give and the amount to 423-225-9022. That's 423-225-9022. You can also give through the mail at ISOW 340 Paul Huff Parkway, Northwest, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37312. Thank you. God bless you and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to this teaching from the International School of the Word. Here's a, if we take this point blank, we pull this out, we put it on a t-shirt and that's all we know, then we can just use this line. No evil shall befall you, nor any plague come near your dwelling. How many of you know we're already in trouble if that's the only verse we pulled out of there? We're already in trouble. Somebody in the house just got the flu, and now our angel's not working for us anymore. So what have I done to make God mad? So we get all of that in our head, and it messes with our theology. So let's look at this. No angel shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways in their hands. They shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Okay, I want to say a couple things about this verse before I start breaking this down, because this is a contingency verse. Um, the first thing I want to say is that heaven does not view death the same way we do. All right. The Bible says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. So heaven sees death as a promotion. We see it as a separation. Heaven sees death as welcome home. We see it as why did you take them from me? So we don't see death the same way that heaven sees death. Uh, heaven sees death as a graduation, a promotion. The Jewish faith has a belief that anyone who dies in their sleep was a righteous person because this is the death of the righteous they die in peaceful sleep without suffering. And they believe that. If that's true, then my grandmother was righteous. And I kind of believe she was. But they believe that. So they do not see death. The Bible says, blessed are the young who die in the Lord. Well, we don't even want to think about that. We don't even want to let our minds go there. The young die, it looks like their life has been wasted instead of their life has been started. We see when we, I have a whole chapter in my book, Heaven on My Mind, dedicated to any mother who's lost a child. And the whole chapter, and I prove it biblically, is about children who grow up in heaven. Because they're not instant adults when they're there. They just grew up there without pain, without sorrow, without ever seeing a bully, without ever knowing some of the pain and sorrows of this life. They had an awesome life on the other side for every mother or father that's lost a child, which is something I wish would never have to happen, but for someone who's lost a child, you will have joy that no one else has in heaven because you had sorrow that no one else had on earth. And the joy will outweigh the sorrow. And that's a great promise. So keep in mind that heaven does not view certain things the way we view them. 
So when we get our theology centered around us and our well-being, and the first time someone gets sick, then God's off the job. The first time that someone gets hurt, the angel let us down. Why did God do this to me? So God gets the blame for things that sometimes is just a part of the human plight. So in this particular passage of Scripture, you have, you have this promise that he will that no evil shall befall you, no plague come near your dwelling. He will give his angels charge over you. There's guardianship there to keep you in all your ways. But understand that this entire promise is contingent upon the next part of the promise. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, so here you see that God says there are times that angels are assigned to believers who have set their love upon him and who have called upon him for deliverance. So we, we talked about Psalm 18 earlier. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and he heard my cry in the midst of his tabernacle and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. He flew upon the wings of the wind and darkness was under his pavilion. Fire held vapor of smoke. But in my distress, I called upon the Lord. So this is a promise that if you are in trouble and you put your faith in the Lord, that God will send guardians to protect you when you put your, your trust and your faith in the Lord. And so it's not, a, it's not a blank check that every believer gets a guardian. Now, I don't know if I want to go into this because I'd rather I don't have anything on the screens to tell you, but I do believe that every believer has a scribe. Why would you say that? That, not er that every believer has an angel that's with you all the time. Is that angel guarding me and as a bodyguard? Not necessarily, but that angel is with you and that angel is recording constantly. Now, this is another teaching. I don't have time to go into it, but it's the teaching on the book of life. Uh, the book of life is not one book. Every person in this room and under the sound of my voice and every person that takes this course, there's a book of life written about you. The book of life is the book of your life. The Bible says that every deed is recorded. Good things. Guess what? Bad things get recorded too. But according to Colossians 2, when you come to Jesus... The handwriting that was against you gets wiped away. And there's nothing there. So the only record of your life in heaven are the peaks without the valleys. Now, does it tell about your storms? Yes, because you put your trust in the Lord. Does it tell about your worship during sacrifice? Yeah, the face of the calf. Does it tell about your battles that you overcame? The face of the lion. It's about you. There are days fashioned for you written when yet none of them were. Psalm 133. It says that, that there are days, uh, actually that's not Psalm 133, Psalm 139. Days fashioned for you when yet there were none of them. So, and he wrote them, if you read that passage, in his book. So God wrote plans for you. You can read Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. God has plans for you to bring you into your destiny uh, even before you're born. Isaiah, I called you to be a prophet in the matrix of your mother. Jeremiah, I called you from the womb to be a prophet to the nations. Uh, Jeremiah, go speak to them. I can't, I'm too young. No, you're not too young. I called you before you were born. Days fashioned for you. So, I believe that angel scribes are recording all of that. They're constantly writing down. Um, how will we receive the crown of righteousness? Because there, there's only five crowns worn in heaven. 
that the Bible tells us about. There could be others. There's only five crowns the Bible tells us that are worn in heaven. Uh, there's the soul winning crown. There's the martyr's crown. There's the crown of glory. There's the crown of righteousness. And there's the crown of life. So when you see those crowns, the crown of righteousness is given to those who have done righteous deeds. But how do we know what a righteous deed is? Jesus says that, the, that in the book of Matthew, that some people given the offering, they think it's a righteous deed. When the lady gave, the widow gave two mites and gave more than he did because hers was righteous because he had more to give and didn't give it. So he says that wasn't counted as righteous. How about the rabbi who's in the, who's in the, uh, the church praying the loudest? And we think because people see our prayers and hear our prayers, that makes us more righteous. And the Lord said, mm -mm, those weren't even recorded. That was all about you. You're trying to get attention. You wanted them to know how good you are at praying. There's nothing wrong. He said, you know, the one I record is when you did it in private. When you went and closed the door and you prayed in secret. Now, intercessors are going to pray anywhere. So don't, don't stop praying in public. <laughs> Thinking that it's not righteous. If your heart's in the right place, you're already in secret. Because understand this, you can be in a room full of a thousand people and you can be in the secret place of the Most High. So, so that's not about being alone that's about your heart being in the right place. Okay, so angels are writing all of that down. Now, I've gotten kind of sidetracked here, so let me get us back on track, okay? So here's another group of angels that I like, camping angels. Anybody want any camping angels? Um, the Bible says the angels of the Lord encamp round about those who fear Him delivers them. Now, I don't know if this is a camping angel, but if he is, I hope he's in my front yard. Because this guy looks fierce to me. And so camping angels basically are there waiting on something to go wrong. The angels of the Lord encamp round about those contingency who fear Him and delivers them. Again, it's a type of guardian, but it's based upon our relationship with the Lord. Um, notice what he says in Psalm 34.1. Because in Psalm 34, 7 is when we see this camping angel uh, promise. But look at what the rest of that verse says. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast of the Lord. The humble shall, be, the sh humble shall hear and, it, and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Great verse. Then he says, two verses later, the angels of the Lord encamp round about me. Those who fear him delivers them. So get this. This guy has had to overcome great fear and put the fear of the Lord in the place of the fear of everything else for these angels to camp around about him. So again, guardian angels, yes, but contingency scripture. If I'm blessing the Lord... If I'm walking with the Lord, if I'm asking God's help in my distress, then yes, then I will see God's deliverance. Um, in Isaiah 63 and 9, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them, and in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. So here's another assigned angel, a guardian, but this angel has been assigned called the angel of his presence to Moses and the children of Israel. Isaiah is referencing that, but the angel was actually assigned back in the book of Exodus 14. So it says, And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud of darkness to the one and gave light by night to the other so they did not come near the other all that night. So the angel moved and blocked the enemy so that the cloud, the pillar of fire could only be seen by the children of Israel as light in the camp. But to the enemy, he shielded the pillar of fire so that to the enemy, it looked darkness. He was hiding the presence so that the enemy could not see that God was in the camp. So he was shielding them. So the enemy saw darkness, the children of Israel saw light. So this angel here is called the angel of his presence 
that was actually assigned to them. Um, I mentioned earlier about the, the books of Enoch that a lot of Jewish people adhere to. And, and one of the books of Enoch, Uriel, one of the angels that I mentioned earlier, is referred to as the angel of his presence. His name means God is my light. And they actually believe that the angel of his presence was an angel, an archangel uh, named Uriel, who was actually assigned to Moses. Uh, again, that's not in the Bible, but it is uh, a belief, a Jewish belief, and they believe they believe it very strongly. Um, you can see here when God actually assigned this angel, he says, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place where I've prepared. So notice this. Now, this is a, this is a cool scripture. So I'm sending you, this angel is sent to bring you in to your promise. He's going to make sure you get there, but beware of him. <laughs> wow, I should beware of my guardian, really? He's been sent on assignment to bring you there, but beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Remember, he's deputized. This angel has been, he's a deputy. He's a law enforcer. He's a, he's a deputy from the king. And because of that, he says he will not tolerate the transgressions of the people. But if you'll obey the law, obey my promises, he will bring you into the promised land and make sure that you get there. He also said that he will fight. He'll go before you and bring you to the Amorites and the Heathites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hevites, and the Jebusites. And I, the Lord says, will cut them off. You don't have to worry about your enemy. I will conquer them. All right, so here's another passage that talks about guardians, but this is unique in the fact that it talks about guardians of unsaved people. Now, that's interesting. Uh, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save those which are lost. This is in the same passage of the, if one leaves the ninety and nine, go after the lost one. So it's in the same passage where it talks about the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost boy. So in all of these, on all three of these stories, something is lost. One is lost in the house. There's a good message. One is lost in the in the fold, there is another message. And one is a, a boy that's wandered from home, the prodigal son. He's lost in the world. And so uh, in each of these cases, he says about this lost one that there's an angel with them. There's a good promise for somebody that's got a wayward child and you're just believing that God's going to bring them back. They are not alone. The, I say sometimes, uh, and I can't, I can't prove this theologically. It's just a thought that the hounds of heaven are on their heels all the time. That's what I say. And people say, where do you get that passage on the hounds of heaven? There is not one. There are no hounds of heaven. It's just a, a hunting phrase that means somebody's bringing them home. Somebody's always on their heels. Okay. So here are angels that are assigned to, to unsaved people. Uh, you also see that anyone who served the Lord... So some people believe, you know, I believe in backsliding. I don't know if you do, but I believe in backsliding. So a lot of people have asked me, you know, do you believe a once saved, always saved? My answer to that is no. I don't believe once saved, always saved, but I do believe once in grace, always in grace. So what's the difference? Well, once saved, always saved means I can't backslide. Once in grace, always Always in grace means that even if I do backslide, the grace of God will be hunting me down the rest of my life. That God will always want me back. That there will always be a Christian in my path, a way to come back home, that God's grace will always be pulling on me wherever I am, whatever's going on in my life, the grace of God. So you see in Psalm 23, the God assigns something to your life that has to be fulfilled by an angel. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. How does that happen? God puts them on assignment. I don't know if goodness and mercy are two angels or one angel on assignment. 
But the Bible says goodness, that goes before you. Mercy goes behind you. So you don't need mercy till you mess up. Goodness is what I need to keep me going. Mercy is what I need when I mess it up, when I mess up goodness. So goodness in front of me, mercy behind me all the days of my life. Once in grace, always in grace, but not once saved, always saved. All right. So then there are some angels that are just comforting angels. So these are these are a few angels that were um, we talked about this one. Well, we talked about angels comforting Jesus on his fast. Here are some more angels that comfort him before the crucifixion. When he was within uh, or when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then the angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. So again, right before the crucifixion, you have the angel coming to Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to talk about one more angel. I've got a lot more material here on this one than I realize, and we're kind of going long on this one. So, And I did get a little sidetracked, so I'm going to go ahead and go to this one. Uh, this is the story of the angel that stopped Balaam. Okay, so uh, in this story, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but, um, you know, uh, Balaam is bumping down the road on his donkey, and um, along comes an angel that stands in front of him to stop him. So I just want to stop there and talk about this, uh, this scene for a moment. So let's do some observations. Here's the first observation. Balaam did not see the angel, but the donkey did. And the donkey stopped and Balaam started beating the donkey because he wanted him to go. And the, and the donkey would not go because there was an angel with a drawn sword in front of him. Now, here's the first question. How can the donkey see the angel and the prophet doesn't see the angel? Well, there's a question there. Can animals see angels? I know a lot of people that are convinced they can. Now, I can't prove to you they can other than with this verse, but I can tell you that this animal did see the angel. So some people believe, I have a, a friend of mine who's, uh, he, he works heavily in the prophetic. Uh, he has a service dog because he's blind in one of his eyes. He's convinced that his dog can smell demons. He's absolutely convinced. <laughs> so I said, well, let me know if he smells any around me when he's around. <laughs> but he is absolutely convinced that his dog can smell demons. You know, I'm not going to argue with him because I don't know if a dog can smell a demon. And I don't know if a donkey can see an angel, but this one did. So I can tell you that there is the possibility that angels can see, that animals rather can see in the supernatural world in a way that we cannot. That's a possibility. Um, the angel was sent to stop Balaam. Now here, here's how he did it. There might be angels sent to stop you. Uh, here's how he did it. He stood in front of him. Have you ever had God to block your way? Have you ever had where you knew, I turned to the left and I couldn't go. I turned to the right. God, the Bible says, God hedged me in. Everywhere I turned, I could not move. God hedged me in. Well, God uses angels to stop you from doing something that you may regret or going someplace that you could get harmed. And many times they block your way. They stop you. Here's another way that he did it. He, he blocked his path, but he also um, frustrated his plans. You ever had God to frustrate your plans? You had all these plans and none of them worked out. It could be an angel who's blocking your way because this is what we know from this story of Balaam. One person could see the angel, the other person could not. So angels can block you and be visible. Angels can block you and be invisible and you not see them at all. Here's the other thing. Here's the last thing that I want to point out. And maybe this is an observation that you can make in your own life. When this angel blocked, uh, when this angel blocked Balaam, he used the voice of another to talk to him. In this case, he allowed the donkey to speak. 
Now, I don't have time to go into that, but I love what that donkey said to him. That's, that's some of the best reading in the Bible. How dare you beat me when I've been hauling you around all this time? Why did you beat me? I was trying to protect you. Didn't you see that angel with a drawn sword and you beat me? And then he said, you beat me again. And then you beat me again. I can just see that, angel, that little donkey on Shrek saying all of that, you know. I can just see him saying all that. How dare you beat me when I've been hauling you around all day long. So keep in mind that this angel used the voice of another to detour him. Maybe it's not a donkey that talks to you, but maybe God used the voice. Maybe an angel influences the voice of someone else to say, what are you doing here? Why are you in this place? You know you shouldn't be here. Have you ever had God to stop you and say, what are you doing here? Have you ever been watching something on TV and the Holy Spirit or an angel say to you, why are you watching that? I've had that happen to me before. Why are you watching that? You know that's not healthy for you. Why are you doing that? Why are you watching that? Or maybe you're in a place and the Holy Spirit says, what are you doing here? This is not where you're supposed to be. What are you doing here? And uh, uh, someone was telling me that they were in a strip joint running from the Lord, hurting in pain, thinking that could, that could help their pain. And somebody with their head down at the bar raised their head up and said, Are you a Christian? Yep. Oh, so you don't play by the rules. And that person said immediately they ran out of that place. Now, you can say whatever you want to say, but that could have been an angel. Showed up in them. I mean, they went to Sodom and Gomorrah. I think they could go where a pole dancer was. I think if they go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he raised his head up and said, you know you're not supposed to be here. So sometimes angels block your way by using the voice of another.